So I think it's important to start with the journey that I've had over the last 14 or 15 years of hosting video on the web. Back in 2003, 2004, most services, YouTube wasn't around then. YouTube, YouTube didn't start till 2005. <clears throat> the way to host video back then was hosting it on your own website. And data actually cost a hell of a lot of money if people were viewing your video, if you could actually convert it into a format that was native for your website, because most people needed to have a plugin, believe it or not, in their browser to actually play your video. Uh, that was normally the Flash player, but there was alternative plugins as well. They were all buggy, things crashed, and you had to spend a very long time encoding your video to a size that wasn't very big at all, probably around 320 by 240 pixels, not like full HD uh, 1920 by 1080 that you get today. So I've been on this journey from the very beginning to where we are now in 2019. So I've gone from wanting to host video on the web to the difficulty of finding out what codecs we need to encode it, to the tools being clunky, to having to expect users to have a plugin installed in their browser, and if not, offer them a plugin to their browser. For that plugin to be vulnerable over time, that eventually Flash got phased out. And then today we've got the whole new web, which is new specifications, new standards. It's developed and grown as the years have gone by, each of these browser companies and technology companies have come together in terms of how they deliver that kind of content across the web. And obviously things have rapidly changed as well with delivery. We've gone from modems that scream to connect to the internet, to ISDN, to ADSL, to fiber connections today. Uh, so we, we've, we've kind of alleviated a lot of problems along the way. But to start with, video hosting was very expensive. And it, it's taken like 10, 15 years to get to the point where we are today, where a lot of that is offset by the circumstances and situations, the subsidizing of this whole ecosystem. And now we get to the point where actually the, the models that we've got in place for advertisers bringing money via advertisers is kind of outweighing what the, adver the advertisers want a certain kind of uh, return on their investment, if you like. So there's a lot of things at play here. There's a lot of things that have, have changed uh, in the ecosystem. And one of those things that I will say is that we've kind of, in the early days of the internet, when we wanted to get onto the internet, we kind of gave up our choice. We gave up our privacy for choice, right? I remember having lots of people asking me in the early days of the internet, which of these free internet providers is the best? somewhere along the line we decided that free we there was a quality there should always be quality when it came to free when something's free you can try all those alternatives yet people expected that that a quality of service came along with that so what am i getting out with all of this well i think the reason why we're at the situation where we are today is that when we upload content to youtube there's a very clear narrative now about being a content creator in 2019 going into 2020 and that is people see posting video on the internet the storyboarding the editing the 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 LUTs they use the camera equipment they use the audio equipment they use the way they edit that content together we've kind of we've blurred the lines between between photography and filming and editing it's kind of turned into this smorgasbord of of just digital creative things where people are, are making money from it. Uh, they've kind of turned it into a career where millions of people are, are following people because of the entertainment that they provide. But I think we've got to the point where we've bartered our way, we've bartered our content into an ecosystem where the algorithm, uh, algorithmic approach of that system dictates what kind of money you get, what kind of traffic you get, what kind of advertisers get linked to your content. If it's popular, if it's trending, uh, if it's kid content, that's why we've had all these copper rules and regulations come into effect. Uh, and what's happened is we started off on the internet wanting to solve a problem, which was we needed video hosting and it needed to be at a price that we could all afford. 
Um, Blip TV was my very first video host in 2014. Then YouTube came along and offered this like free upload, whatever you want. The, there were some sort of regulations in terms of time and it was very clunky and it, the UI was very bad. Seriously, go and have a look at it. And gradually what's happened is that more advertising money, the more dollars that seeped into these systems, the more they've, they've taken on this life of their own. In the early 80s, everybody was buying fiber connections up uh, which eventually had this kind of like arms race for fiber connecting buildings to buildings at super fast speeds and google came in and bought a hell of a lot of that black fiber that is fiber that's obviously not lit at either end and ended up doing a lot of their video hosting using this dark fiber between server centers so they had no bills as such to to be able to move this content around and then obviously scaling came into it where they needed to put some more servers into it. So eventually at some point they needed to sell this on and then Google came along and saw this as a way to reinforce their whole sort their, their whole search um uh, their, their whole search business being the second biggest search engine in the world. So I know that's really overwhelming to get to but my point is here is that at some point, you have to realize that we don't own the data that we put up there anymore. Yes, I can go and download each one of my YouTube videos. I have to put in a request to download all of my YouTube videos. But we have to accept that we've bartered our way, uh, bartered away, should I say, our ability to have control over that content. As soon as we put digital assets into the cloud that are not on services that we don't own, they no longer belong to us. As much as we like to think they do, I'm sure if you look into the fine detail of the paperwork or the document that you clicked on yes when you set up your account, uh, you probably don't own it. So what we're really annoyed about here when you think of like cryptocurrency videos getting banned is that there's obviously an alternative narrative somewhere along the line where either advertisers or YouTube or just somebody wants to shape the way that that content is being shared on that platform and that's pushed a lot of people i think to decentralize platforms that is platforms that don't have a central entity at the heart they don't have youtube limited or alphabet whatever it is now with google managing it um i want to get into a few more things but i just wanted to put out that out there because i think it's an important factor to understand that this is a long journey from 2005 when YouTube was born to 2019. YouTube is a granddaddy when it comes to internet web applications. 14 years on the web is like 100 years. Uh, YouTube is this like common uh, term that people use. You know, just Google it, just YouTube it. Oh, it'll be on YouTube. You'll find tutorials and how-tos and things on there. It's actually helped dramatically. It's become the video Wikipedia of our time. But obviously every business in the world is getting impact by the decentralization of services because it's actually working out that it's more efficient to have these services spread out rather than just being in one centralized location so i want to get into a few of these other topics i know this has went on really really long remember you can skip through to the places to host if you just look into places to host but i want to give you a bit of a background behind it so you can make a decision about the content that you put on the web going into 2020 and beyond